This is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy with another episode of Marxism with fellow editors and fellow Marxes, Mark Leibecki and Mark Melton, addressing uh, two articles published in Providence this week, uh, the first of which uh, was by our German contributor, Tobias Kremer, who has done a lot of work on right-wing nationalism in continental Europe, and who uh, speculates that uh, there is an emerging post-Christian right in America that will uh, potentially uh, push aside or displace the more traditional, more traditionally Christian religious right, uh, and more aligned with uh, rightist groups in Europe that may profess to be defenders of Christendom, but are themselves uh, religiously uh, indifferent and sometimes personally hostile to traditional Christianity. Tobias uh, pivots off of the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th and the odd brew of uh, religious, um, or rather folk religious uh, nationalism that seemed to motivate a lot of the attackers. I would say that um, that kind of folk religion, American style is probably still more connected to traditional religion than would say the uh, far right political party in Germany, uh, the Alliance for uh, Deutschland, the Alliance for Germany, uh, which again uh, professes to want to defend Christian Europe, uh, but is itself um, at best indifferent towards religion. I think religiosity in America is still, for better or for worse, uh, wherever it's coming from politically is still much more uh, vibrant and uh, heartfelt than it would be in most of European societies, including on the right. But Mark Levecki, you have lived in Europe yourself, uh, including Czechoslovakia and uh, elsewhere. Uh, where do you think uh, America is in terms of possibly transitioning into a post-Christian political right? Yeah, great question. It was a good article, very interesting. Uh, and I should probably I should probably qualify where I've lived so all my Slovak or Czech friends don't hound me after this. I never technically lived in Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. I got there a few years afterward. I lived in Slovakia, but uh, uh, point taken. I, I suspect we're we're really early in that transition. If if we are on the transition, I I, I think along the lines you do. I, I think we're very early on. I think that was, I think what we've seen is, is a real thing. There is a, there is a post-Christian right, just like there's a post-Christian left. Uh, but I, I, I don't suspect it, it holds sway. I don't think it has anything like uh, uh, the kind of momentum necessary to push out the more traditional uh, Christian conservative. So I, th I, th I think we're, I think we have plenty of time to right the ship, so to speak. Uh, I think the more interesting question is to to note if there is overlap, uh, what both groups, the post-Christian right and the Christian right, what both groups oppose and why it is that at least the Christian right seems to think that they can form an alliance, even if it's an uneasy, uncomfortable alliance, in order to stand against something that they see coming from the left. Uh, I think that in terms of, you know, fixing the situation or addressing the situation, I, I think a lot of work still has to be done in identifying what it is uh, that concerns the Christian right and why it is that potentially standing alongside, you know, the, the, the Trump phenomenon or the post-Christian right might make political sense. That's where I would want to go with it. Mark Belton, you have your own uh, European experiences. Uh, how do you assess the rise, the potential rise of a post-Christian right uh, in America? It strikes me that the post-Christian left is uh, hyper egalitarian, uh, coercively so, while the post-Christian right, uh, of course, uh, would deny the very premises of human equality. But what are your thoughts? Right. So yeah, I lived in France and Scotland uh, 
combined for a couple of years. And so uh, I actually wrote about the, some of those experiences last fall where I talked about the idea of the religious economy theory and how in Europe where you have a lot of state influence in the religion, I there's a, this theory and there seems to be some good evidence to suggest that it causes a decrease in actual religious practice, but you still have an increase in the, or a large number of people who will still identify as Christian or Protestant or Catholic or whatever their nation is supposed to be. They'll identify with it without actually practicing it. And in some places, this can um, cause some violence and where you have people who adhere to the ideology and they, you know, their team Pope or their team Orange or their team whatever, team Muhammad, and but they don't actually practice religion. And so those groups actually tend to be a bit more violent. There's been some research into that. And so uh, the, so the situation here, uh, I think that we have much more vibrant religious practice because of our free exercise clause, where it's easier to set up churches to uh, churches don't receive nearly as much support from the state as some of the European state churches do. And so in that research, you know, kind of argued that we we're going to have more vibrancy, but we do have this decline in religious practice. I, I think with IRD probably does more research into the exact numbers and which groups are declining, but it tends to be right. The, the main line, I believe, and the, um, I also believe the Catholic Church attendance has gone down. I think Tool, you might be able to speak more specific to those numbers, but I wonder if part of this post-religious right is connected to the decline of some of the other main churches uh, declining. And so we do, I think, see some of this with the Capitol riot, where we have people who, uh, I, get, I think Jenny Cutt is an example, possibly, where she, I'd have to go back and double check the video, but I believe she kind of mentioned some Christian language, but it's kind of hard to see uh, any other Christian language that she's used when she was running for a mayor position in Texas, but she was inside the Capitol and she's since been arrested. And there's some other characters that we've seen who have used Christian language. In fact, we're going to run a review on Monday about the QAnon shaman and uh, He's kind of this arch, you know, this person who clearly isn't very Christian. I believe he, he's ex-Catholic, I believe, but he wrote a book last year or a couple of years ago that he calls himself God loving. And so like, how does that actually play into like it's claiming as Christian label, but there seems to be a lack of evidence of Christian practice. And so I think when we're talking about this post-Christian right, it's going, it's a developing trend, it seems. It seems to be an emerging trend, but it's going to be a very very interesting, and I think it would be very troubling if it um, went the way that it's gone in Europe. Shifting to Eric Patterson's article on the uh, failures of the Arab Spring 10 years ago to usher in uh, democracy anywhere except for Tunisia, and he credits that in part to uh, a, a failure to understand uh, American understandings of uh, religious pluralism and separation of church and state, which uh, majority Muslim cultures understand is uh, almost a direct attack upon uh, the sovereignty of Allah or some kind of diminishing of the public importance of religion. They often hear these uh, aspirations through the lens of their experience uh, with French culture over the last two centuries, which tends to be much more restrictive, if not hostile, towards the public role of religion. So uh, Mark Levecki, did you agree with Eric Patterson, who seemed uh, very optimistic about that if these concepts are properly explained to Mideast audiences, they would be much more open to religious pluralism and uh, freedom of religion and freedom of speech. What do you think? Oh, I like his argument. I, I think there's a lot there. Uh, do I, you know, am I as maybe sanguine as, as he is, or maybe he appears to be? Uh, I doubt it. I, I sort of doubt he is as well, it's certainly not just going to be a matter of clarifying terms and then all will be well. Uh, but there is certainly something to that. Um, and, and I think it goes deeper than that. It's not simply a misunderstanding of what we might mean by separation of church and state or uh, uh, you know, secular society or pluralism. It has to do with their understanding of our understanding of freedom uh, you know, personal and collective, you know, I think there, there's all sorts of civilizational uh, uh, misunderstanding. They have their moral narratives that shape them in a particular way. We have ours. 
And I think it's very difficult for them to morally perceive how it is that we morally perceive the world. Um, I think he's, I think it's very interesting, uh, this notion that American separation of church and state is different than French laissez-faire, which is certainly true. Um, I think laissez-faire in, in, in many regards is abhorrent. Uh, but it seems equally true that here there is an increasing number of people that are perfectly comfortable with a French conception of laissez-faire and that you know there, there are groups that are, are attempting to, to push religion out of the public square altogether. So in that sense, uh, you know, the Muslim observer in another country might not be entirely wrong when they perceive that American ideals of the separation of church and state are something like laissez-faire. Um, that's not in the founding. Uh, that's not how the majority of us see it. But there are certainly those who wish for a religion to remain a private event uh, and that it doesn't rear its head in, in public discourse. We see that uh, at present. Mark Melton, are you hopeful that uh, democracy, pluralism, religious freedom can come to the Mideast in the near future, or is uh, history stacked against that possibility? I think it would be, uh, it's gonna, it would have to be a long, slow slog, and a lot of these things are going to have to be kind of almost like in a Burkean-esque style, like slowly built over time. If you try to push for a radical change, you might end up with uh, more turmoil, but the but I mean, I think there's always reason for hope and there's, you know, we're talking about from a Christian realist perspective, I think one of the reasons why I kind of fell into Christian realism is that if it, when I would read international relations and read foreign policy stuff, I would find myself to be an extreme realist, extremely pessimistic because I believe in, you know, humans are uh, sinful, um, human depravity and whatnot. But I also have this Christian hope of that, you know, God and the Holy Spirit can still work, things can still get better. And so, but, you know, the more and more I look at all of these situations and read these histories of different countries, it's always going to be a long, slow generational slog. And even in the United States, you know, we start from a very we would not want to live in, I think, in the United States of 1776 today because of this situations of, you know, of course, the slavery and everything else, like even religious freedom, I think was, um, you know, we still had established uh, churches um, at that point that were slowly being dismantled. And so I think we're in a much better situation today, but it takes generations to really get there. And so, and I think there's a lot of writers, even in Islam, who um, like, I'm not very familiar, I haven't read a lot of his stuff, but there's uh, Mustafa Akiola, if I'm pronouncing his name right, who has um, written from a Muslim perspective that's going to be more of a liberal view. And so I think that if you have those types of writers over time, I think they can have an impact, but you're going to have to have better free exercise. It can't be this laicite situation where you try to keep, you know, the religion out of the public square. And in France, where you ban people from wearing religious symbols. Like when I taught in France, um, we had this whole lecture um, orientation about you can't wear religious symbols. And for me, like I have a cross, which I wear underneath and I couldn't wear it out, which is fine. I never wear it. But if they were really getting at it, it's like they didn't want to wear, have you wear any type of Muslim dress or Muslim garb and um, whether the burqa or the um, niqab or whatever. And so uh, you can't have that type of laicite um, pushing religion out of the public square. Um, you have to allow people to uh, freely express their religion. For listeners who haven't read these articles, uh, check them out at the Providence website, uh, Tobias Creamer on a post-religious right in America and Derek Patterson on consequences of the Arab Spring. Gentlemen and uh, fellow Marks, thank you for another scintillating conversation. Until next week, bye-bye. <laughs>